Well, good morning. How's everybody doing pretty good this morning? How's your January been? Is it winding down? Pretty good? New Year started off. It's a done. January is almost done. Hard to believe, right? I pray this morning that the Lord is really just speaking to you through this sermon series. Uh, it's been exciting to be part of that sermon series, and I'm here this morning to describe a little bit what we've been talking about. Um, as a body of believers, maybe you're new, we've been reviewing the last four chapters um, throughout this series and have pinpointed many characteristics that enable us to live as a follower of Christ, thanks to the letters from Apostle Paul to Ephesus. Our vision for this sermon series has us pondering what a best-dressed church resembles in this pre- present day and age. And on New Year's Eve, Pastor Greg began a sermon with a, or began our sermon series with a sermon entitled "Clothed in Christ." His sermon helped us understand that God chose us, and Christ Himself clothes us as we begin our spiritual journey. Next was Pastor Dave's sermon entitled "The Extreme Makeover." This message pointed out that we begin a period of transformation once we accept Christ as our Savior. It reminded us that we were once dead, but now we're alive in Jesus Christ. Pastor Seth followed him with a message of one body. And as we continue our spiritual walk in Christ, we're reminded and encouraged that we, the Gentiles, are included in that promise. And that it's up to us to connect with a body of believers to help guide and edify us as we walk through this world. Last week we heard from Pastor Steve's message entitled, Off with the Old and On with the New. And that message illustrated how Christ helped us put our old selves to bed and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us as we live our new life. We were challenged to not fall on our past sins, but keep our eyes focused on our salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, if you haven't figured out, I'm going to be doing Ephesians 5 today. (laughs) And I'm excited to bring, you know, what's next? You know, after we've gone through the extreme makeover and we have a body that's here to edify us, encourage us, what do we have to do? Well, I'm going to share that with you here in a moment. Next week, Pastor Dennis is going to be uh, bringing up the Carl Lewis leg of our sermon series. Carl Lewis, anybody? Anybody? A couple people? Thank you. Um, But he's going to be finishing out that sermon series with Ephesians 6. So as we delve into chapter 5 of Ephesians, I have a specific goal in mind. And today, I want us to leave with a slogan. And this is not just any slogan. I mean, this slogan, by the time we finish with this sermon, I hope you're going to be able to use this slogan for your your family, your friends, your your co-workers, uh, definitely your spouses. Oh, and you can utilize this slogan when you're shopping at Walmart or Martin's. uh, Anytime you're at Food Line, maybe you go to Kroger. Once you're eating at Chick-fil-A or... Uh, Cracker Barrel, or the Bistro, you can use this sermon and this slogan for that purpose. I'm hoping by the time we're finished with this sermon, you'll be enticed to use this group of words on your mother, your father, your children, and then definitely your spouses. And, And let me just say, by the time we get to the slogan part, if you use this on strangers, or if you use this On professionals, you're going to get some weird glances. They're going to be like, whoa, yeah, it's a big one. But, you know, I don't give that slogan justice. So this morning, I'm going to invite my daughter, Emily, up to stage. Emily, if you'll come on up. Everybody give Emily a big round of applause. (laughs) Emily, are you out of your comfort zone? I'm sorry, what was that? (laughs) Oh, yes, yes. Here, go ahead and hold the microphone. Now, Emily... Um, believe it or not, she is a former cheerleader. Uh, Big Red, let's give her a big clap, yeah? 
So to illustrate our slogan this morning, Emily can say it the best. Emily, if you would, please. You've been served. Whoa. Can you do that one more time? <laughs> one more time. Oh, yeah. You got to put the snap into it. Go ahead. You've been served. Woo! Everybody give her a round of applause. Woo! You've been served. I can't do it as good as her. No, nowhere near it. I, uh, you've been served. Okay, yeah. You've been served. Now, normally, when you heard that group of words, if you're a cheerleader or maybe you've been to a cheer competition, you are on the opposite end of something negative. You got served. And that could have been in a dance competition. I don't even know what the lingo is, but you just got your butt danced off. That's what it comes down to. But this morning, I want us to change that negative connotation from you've been served to you've been served. Now, in order to really find out why we're going to utilize you've been served in our best dressed church, we have to read Ephesians 5. So let's everybody turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 5. I'm going to be reading from an NIV this morning. Ephesians 5. Now, Pastor Dave gave us a great tool. God's Electric Power Company. If you're looking for Ephesians this morning, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So it's right in between those two. Thank you, Pastor Dave. <laughs> let's read Ephesians 5, starting with verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children... And live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish 
holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you may also must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Let's pray. Father, I praise you and thank you this morning for your words through Apostle Paul, God. We just pray that this morning as we begin to delve into your words, you open our minds and our spirits, Father, to understand your will, Father. We ask you to help us understand how we can be followers of Christ this morning. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Now, as you can see, Ephesians 5 is extremely rich and revealing um, for followers of Christ. And as Pastor Greg revealed in week one, this letter was addressed to a church who was passionate and on fire for the Lord, just like this church. You know, they wanted to find out how to be a true follower of Christ, not just a believer. You know, they had been down the road of following the wrong belief system, as Acts 19 indicated. You know, they were were following John's baptism until Apostle Paul came along and then introduced them to the Spirit's baptism. But I want us to hone in on a few passages this morning that will help us make a connection from best-dressed church to our slogan of, you've been served. So all you note-takers, here's your chance. Get ready. Get your phones out, get your pencils. If anybody's using pencils nowadays, anybody know what a pencil is anymore? I don't think so. Oh, oh, we got a couple people with pencils. <laughs> so at the top of your paper, I want you to write down best dressed church or how to become a best dressed church. As I reveal the answers from Ephesians 5, you will be assigned some homework. Miss Kenise, homework. Just kidding. But you will have some questions that I want you to think about as we begin this revelation. So, everybody, let's get started. First, Ephesians 5.1 indicates what we have to do in order to become a best-dressed church. We have to first be an imitator of God. What does an imitator of God even even really mean? The Message Bible says it plain as day. It says... Watch what God does and do it. Easy, right? But I have a question for you this morning. Who is your imitator of God? Is it your mom? Your dad? Your friends? Is is it a pastor? Hopefully, it's yourself. Hopefully, it's your reflection. You know, in order to be a best-dressed church and in order to make a connection to you've been served, we have to be an imitator of God. Now, our second revelation is in verse 2. It says that we have to live a life of love. Once again, the Message Bible kind of illustrates what the type of love we're talking about here. It says, to keep company with Him, Him being whom? Who? God. Amen, Jamie. And it says to learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of Himself to us. Love like what the Message Bible says. But my question is, how do we live a life of love like that when this world says, get revenge? They wronged you. Get revenge on them. Get them back. How do we live a life of love when the worldly thirst, the sin, tells us to do opposite? 
figure that out here in a minute. Thirdly, verses 15 and 16 reveal what we have to do in order to be a best-dressed church. We have to live wise and make the most of every opportunity. This morning, are you living wise and taking advantage of your opportunities? You do realize that God has specifically planned something for each of you. And it's your responsibility to be prepared for that opportunity. And that may be serving, but it's your responsibility to get out there and be prepared for that. Lastly, the most vital revelation that Paul gives us to be a best-dressed church is this. We have to submit to one another. Who is one another? And when we submit, are, are you submitting to authority and leadership, your spouse? You, you do realize that all three of those come from the Lord, right? You don't want to be disobedient. But we have to submit, submit to our presidents. Submit to our pastoral leadership. We have to submit and love our spouse. Now, for this church this morning, one that is seeking how to be a follower of Christ, not just a believer, I raise a final question for you. How are each of you going to be part of this best-dressed church? See, when we summarize what Apostle Paul revealed in Ephesians 5, I start to scratch my head and I start to go, hmm, let me think about this. How am I going to be an imitator of God through while living a life of love by taking advantages of opportunities through submission. You're wondering that? Well, friends, it's easy. How do we do all those things? How do we be a best-dressed church? Very simple. We serve. It's that easy. We serve. If we want to be a best-dressed church, we have to serve everyone. Can't just be limited to specific individuals. Now, I know for some of you, you're probably going, now, oh, well, uh, Pastor Greg, Pastor Brad, that sounds okay, but I'm a new Christian. And I don't have many Christian friends, man. What do I turn for examples? You know, I, I went to church when I was younger, and they judged me, so <laughs> I left that place. I didn't have any examples to go by. They were poor examples. Where do I turn for examples? And let me tell you, if you're a numbskull like me, I had to learn a very important principle about six years ago. And the answer is, the answer is very simple. It's right here. That's where you're going to get your example. It's right here. See, see in 1 Peter 2.21, it helps us reveal that to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. See, through here, through these pages, in, in your Bible app, there is example after example after example on how to live, how to serve, how to be a best-dressed church. I guess the Lord knew there would be some thick-headed dummies like me that needed a step-to-step -step manual on how to serve and how to live. Any more out there? Keeping your hand. Oh, there's a couple back in the back. Okay. Thank you, fellas, for your honesty. But through all the examples that Jesus gives us, you know, there's one that is kind of elevated. There's one that's kind of highlighted for me, in my opinion. You know, Pastor Greg is a firm advocate for this passage because it portrays an act of service that, that we are to model daily. It helps us become a best-dressed church and then allows us to say, you've been served. I want you to mark this in your Bibles. You want to know what it is? It's John 13. John 13. We're going to read John 13 because I want to, I want to let you know why we read John 13. It describes in here how our Lord and Savior 
gave a tremendous example of his love. Quoted, it showed them the full extent of his love. So let's turn to John chapter 13. Verse 1, it was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. There it was. Read it again. He now showed them the full extent of his love. Verse 2. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Issachar, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord! Are you going to wash my feet? There's a thick-headed numbskull right there. <laughs> yeah, right there. That was the first one. Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. me i'm telling you <laughs> okay <laughs> when he had finished washing their feet he put on his clothes and returned to his place do you understand what i've done for you he asked them you call me teacher and lord and rightly so for that is what i am now that i your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also should wash one another's feet i have set you an example there it is an example that you should do this as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, if you were reading the down south version of the Bible, it would have ended with Jesus saying, oh, by the way, you've been served. I mean, Jesus was a model servant. Here, he was a model servant to his disciples. You know, washing a guest's feet, that was a job for a slave. You know, when guests would come off the road, you know, they didn't have Nikes back then or Under Armors, Brooks, cowboy boots. They didn't have any of that. They had a simple sandal that attached to the bottom of their feet. And that was if they were rich enough to have that. And as they traveled from Jericho to Jerusalem to Bethlehem, here, there was mud and dirt and sand, and then sometimes the wrong type of animals left the wrong type of stuff. And here, that servant would wash the guest's feet. Here, this example, Jesus put on a towel, got down on his knees, as the lowliest of slaves would do, and then he washed and dried his disciples' feet. Jesus illustrated what we're describing in Ephesians. You know, he was not being an imitator of God. He was being God himself, serving his disciples, serving us. He was showing the full extent of his love. Would we say he was being wise but taking advantage of the opportunity? Let me tell you, all the disciples were there. He was submitting to each one of those disciples, even the one that he knew was going to betray him. Now, as we talk about submission and serving, you know, as I've read Ephesians 5 about 20 times in the past two months, I kind of take a big gulp each time I have to read Ephesians 5, 21 through 32. Hmm. It's still even hard to say it. You know, it's no secret if you've lived uh, or been a part of this church over the past year, you've found out that uh, submission and loving my wife has not been my forte. Fortunately, I've been given some grace by God to be able to change that. But, 
you know, this sermon series had me questioning and evaluating how I'm lining up to be a follower of Christ. You know, how am I going to daily say to my wife, oh, you've been so good. How am I going to say that to my family? But you know, today I want to toot my own horn a little bit. That's right. I want to share with you how the Lord is shaping me to serve my wife. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to have to show you a new member of our family. I'd like you all to meet Lulu Bell Hannah. Yeah, Lulu Bell. She's amazing, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Don't let that picture for one second fool you into what that little furball is capable of. I mean, yeah, she's cute and cuddly, but let me tell you. That little rascal loves running and sprinting, and her most favorite thing to do is to irritate her bigger sister, Maggie, which is our beagle. She'll grab Maggie by the neck fat and then drag Maggie around everywhere she goes. And then when she's, you know, finished and Maggie goes to retaliate, she's, Mama, Mama, help me, help me. Yeah, <laughs> little Lulu. Whew. Well, you know, little Lulu is about eight months old. And if you've ever owned a pet, you probably have been down the road of potty training. Any person had to potty train an animal before? Whew. It's one of the most frustrating things I think I've ever done. Uh, amen. Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, so we thought, okay, you know, this is not going to be a big deal. Our beagles, she was pretty good. I mean, she was decent. She wasn't the best. But we would lay down a puppy pad. Maggie, go to the puppy pad, do her business. Lulu, not so much. I mean, she could get the number two part down, but when it came to the P part, she wasn't having none of it. And, you know, we heard all the remedies. Oh, Brad, Brad, you have to try positive reinforcement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, oh, Brad, you have to give them, uh, you have to give them treats. And we've tried ointments. And we've tried, um, we, I even tried praying over the thing. Because I was like, God created it, so he should be able to fix it and steal nothing. People would say, oh, Brad, you have to crate it. They love the crate. They won't do anything in the crate. <laughs> yeah, not so much. Oh, oh, Brad, if you limit their water intake, especially before nighttime, that will take care of the problem. Not me, and not Lulu. Yeah, we tried it, man. I'm telling you. Then somebody said, "Oh, well, Brad, you have to, you have to take the dog outside. Let the dog go outside." I'm like, oh, "Really? Take the dog outside? Our dog can't make it from the house to the car for a vet appointment. How in the world is she going to go out and use the outside?" But let me say, it's working. It's getting better. Praise God. However, that left a little issue in our home. A chore. Yeah. Taking that wonderful dog outside. And guess what? It's wintertime. And every one of my family just loves at 6 a.m. to volunteer to get up and take little Lulu out to go potty at 6 a.m., right? No, not so much. So, you know, I began to wonder. You know, how, how can I submit to my wife? How can I submit to my husband? And then the sermon series happened. And here, I was thinking, you know what? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to volunteer to take that dog out. Every opportunity I got. I'm not going to let my wife have to endure the rain and snow and icy weather, the wind blast. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to love her. I'm going to submit to her. I'm going to serve her and love her. And then when I'm done, I'm going to say, sweetie, you've been so good. I want you to imagine this morning what it would be like if everyone in here 
started to submit and love your husband, as Ephesians 5 says. Be in full submission to, to your spouses as if we are to the Lord. Could you imagine what that would be like? Wow. You know, when we try to outserve our spouses, we're going a little bit farther. We're anticipating their needs. You know, we're, we're, we're concerned for how their day is going. We're, we're worried that they're not going to make it tomorrow. We're going to do our best to build them up, to edify them, to love them. It's our job. It's a commandment. He told us that. And let me say, you know, there are plenty of people out there that are ready to bring you down, to bring your spouse down, to bring your family members down. There's plenty of people that are waiting to drag them under. And it's going to be up to you, and it's going to be up to you, and it's going to be up to you to start submitting and serving your spouse. You know, we're trying to be the light, as Ephesians 5 said. By being the light, by being a best-dressed church, we can be the light. And see, when we begin to serve this world and submit to everyone, especially our spouses, we begin to allow Christ's gift, His gifting, to flow through us, to become a vessel for Christ's gift to impact this dark world. We can be the light. The best part is, it's not just me, and it's not just pastors, it's not just your life group leaders, it's you. You, and it's you. You can be the light in this world. For some of you spouses this morning, and I'm not pointing any fingers, your spouse's feet need your hands on them. They need them. They need, they need your hands to give your wife or your husband a foot massage. Those stinky, smelly feet. They need it because by the end of the day, they may be broken and they may need somebody to build them up. They may need you to start their day for tomorrow. Did you all know that each week this body of believers you serve families on Mondays and Wednesdays? Probably didn't even know it, did you? You're like, wait a second, I don't come on Monday or Wednesday. Some of them do. The pastor staff and the... But let me tell you, you're picking up these chairs every Sunday and putting them in the sanctuary, putting them to the sides. Do you realize you're serving young warriors, our wrestling program? You're serving the family members that come here Mondays and Wednesdays. And then the best part in turn is you're getting served back. They're putting those chairs right back down. You know what the crazy part is? Half of them don't even go to church here. What I'm saying for this body of believers this morning is we have to begin to have a servant mindset. This county needs us. They need a united body to stand up and be an imitator of God. See, when you're at the grocery store and you're pushing in that buggy, you can be an imitator of God. You can, you can be an imitator of God simply by bringing in one grocery cart at a time. Could you imagine being at Walmart and 300 individuals bring in one shopping cart, just one, what do you think that, that would do for a buggy pusher? I mean, could you imagine serving them that way? This county needs us. On February 10th, I have a number written down here because I've prepared this sermon. I had 120 guests. Actually, what was the number, Karen? 154 guests special needs are going to be in this building February 10th. And you know what they want to see? 
They want to see how Christ would treat them. They want to see what God, how he would interact with them and love them. This morning, my question for you, are you going to take advantage of that opportunity? Are you going to be wise as we've described? Worship team, come on up. Friends, it's up to us. We've laid the foundation, the Lord has laid the foundation for us through His Scripture on what we should do. The sermon series helps prepare you for what we are to do. We're to serve. We're to be an imitator of God. We're to live a life of love through submission. We're to do our best to imitate God. It's up to you. Each day, God gives you an opportunity to do it. Everybody stand to your feet.